Gary Jeffries, who is director of Conrad Blucher Institute for Surveying and Science at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi, and Gary will be talking about sea level rise along the, on the Texas coast. There you go. Thank you. Um, when John asked me to do this, I said, well, John, you know, um, the gas and floats on the top of the water, and it doesn't really care what the sea level is. But um, it does impact uh, the Texas coast fairly significantly. So um, I'm just going to give you an overview of what um, sea level has been doing in Texas over at least the last 20 years. That's how long the, um, the Blue Tree Institute has been wa measuring water level along the Texas coast. Okay, and we're responsible for the Texas Coastal Ocean Observation Network that actually got um, the construction of which started uh, exactly 20 years, years ago in 1988. Um, we've installed approximately 80 tide gauges in that time, but um, we've removed quite a lot of them because a lot of them have only been in temporary locations, but we have now 30 active stations along the coast uh, indicated on that map there by the blue flags and um, they're also integrated with the red flags which are the tide gauges which belong to the National Ocean Service and part of the national network. Our primary sponsor for this is the Texas Australian Land Office. Uh, they're particularly interested in um, knowing what the water level is along the coast because it defines what we call the littoral boundary, which is the tidal boundary from privately owned uplands to the state's own submerged lands. And the General Land Office is responsible for state lands in Texas and is responsible for the state-owned submerged lands. They often find themselves in court over where that littoral boundary is. And so we need accurate water level measurements to determine the tidal datum which defines the littoral boundary in Texas, and there's actually two, it's the mean high water mark and also the mean higher high water mark. And, and in reality, there's very little difference between the two. Um, we're also sponsored by the Texas Water Development Board who uses our data to um, study circulation in the bays and estuaries. Um, the National Ocean Service now uh, funds us to maintain their gauges and some um, other projects like the ports, the real-time physical oceanographic data system for um, um, shipping and, and marine management along the um, intercoastal and also the ship channels. So they sponsor us, but our biggest sponsor right now is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers who uses our data on a daily basis to manage dredging of the intercoastal waterway and the ship channel. They are primary sponsors. Um, we measure the, the um, water level um, primarily um, to determine those uh, tidal elevations, these tidal datums. And we do that to the exact same standards that the National Ocean Service does. And they have a long history of doing this, actually over 200 years now, going back to 1807. Uh, they have set the standards for um, the legal parameters behind uh, water level measurement in the United States. So we follow their procedures, we use exact same instrumentation, and what it amounts to is uh, these days it's a digital system using acoustic sounding, and we have 181 one second observations over a three minute period. We take the mean of those observations calculate the standard deviation and reject observations three times the standard deviation away from the mean, recalculate the mean, and that becomes one water level observation. So we do that every six minutes, so it's <coughs> 10 uh, values per hour. We also measure meteorological data as well, because the, the, the wind speed, direction, barometric pressure also has a fairly major influence in water uh, level in Texas. So we. We measure that data as well, and also we, we adhere to those standards that uh, the National Weather Service does for those. But the reason we have to follow these high standards is because the, the, um, the data goes into court over these boundary disputes, and so it has to be to that standard, otherwise it would not be um, admissible as evidence in court. So it's done to very high standards. 
And because it's all digital now, we get it back to the university in real time. But this is the, the products that we actually produce out of measuring water level over a long period of time. And um, up on the top right there, you'll see the word epoch there twice. Now, an epoch is the time interval where we use the data to actually calculate the tidal datums. And this is a typical tidal datum product for Port Aransas. And you notice we have two epochs up there. Well, when we first started doing this, the, um, the current epoch was the 1960 to 1978 epoch. That's a 19-year period in which we use the data level for all those six-minute observations to compute the mean sea level, the mean high, high water, and, and the other data. We use 19 years. It's, it's actually a rounded up number from 18.6 years, which is the time it takes for the, all the permutations of position between the sun, the earth, and the moon to get back to where it started from. And the National Ocean Service has a very strict definition of what a tide is. And it's the change in water level that's purely driven by the gravitational effect of the sun and the moon on, on the Earth. So um, storm surges and meteorological events do not count. And so if we have a storm surge in our data set, we actually throw that out. It's just the forcing of water level change by the astronomical <coughs> gravitational pull of the sun and the moon, which causes the tides. Uh, but of course, we know that doesn't happen uh, when we get a storm surge. But anyway, this is how we, we calculate it. And, and it's done over this 19-year period. The most recent one was recalculated after uh, 2001, that 19-year period. And this is, this is actually um, dictated by Congress. The United States Congress is when these occur. And they roughly occur every 25 years. So the latest one, we're using data sets from 1983 to 2001. And there are the values computed under those uh, headings there for mean sea level, for example, back in 1978. Port Aransas was 1.497 metres. And that jumped up to 1.575 metres for the 2001 epoch. And that's actually, if you go out to feet, the difference is a quarter of a foot. Now, there's some problems with that in that most people don't know that's happened because this is a fairly official thing. And this is what surveyors need to, um, to use when they're defining the littoral boundary. And where the littoral boundary is is where the mean high high water mark intersects the shoreline. And that's where the littoral boundary is. And that's what surveyors use to define where the shoreline is for delineating private land uplands with the state owned submerged lands. Um, it's unfortunate that um, the rest of the um, United States government does not seem to um, care much about that increase in water level. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But um, all the data that we produce now is available online and on the web for anyone to, to see. And all the data that we've ever collected going back to um, 1991 is now online. So any historic data that you might want to use is also up there and available to um, the users. But what about long-term sea level rise? Okay. Um, starting back in the early 1990s, um, NASA and NOAA and a bunch of other agencies around the world started putting up satellites that were measuring sea surface topography. These were um, fairly high-powered lasers which just did vertical shots down to the uh, sea surface and started measuring um, the topography of, of the oceans. And they got very good at this. They can measure now down to a couple of centimeters of every um, observation and they're also measuring wave heights and stuff. But if you take all the data from what's collected so far from the satellite altimetry, and you take out all the seasonal effects, this is what we're seeing um, just over this um, nearly 15 year period now, is we're seeing an average rate of sea level rise of about 2.4 millimeters per year. This is calculated by NOAA, by the way. And so, um, 
the majority of the sea level rise globally is being caused by uh, thermal expansion of the, of the oceans. Uh, of course, we we also noticed that the um, the poles are diminishing and some major glaciers are shrinking, and so that's adding to the sea level rise as well. But the majority of it is oceanographers believe it's um, thermal expansion that's causing the sea level rise. And it's actually been going on for quite a long time. And here in Texas, measuring the water level at the longest uh, tide gauge we have, which is in uh, Galveston on Pier 21 on the, um, on the bay side, we have this 100-year record now showing uh, an increase in water level, fairly linear over time, um, which amounts to Galveston about 2.13 feet per century, or about 6.6 .6 millimeters per year. Um, but what we're seeing here, a lot, lot faster than the global rate, is because we have subsidence in Texas. And I've highlighted on this graph um, these red lines. NGVD stands for the National Geodetic Vertical Datum of 1929. This was the first time all the level networks in the United States were adjusted as a homogeneous network and tied to 26 tide gauges around the country. Okay, that's an important number to remember, that 1929. And back then, the assumption was that sea level around the country from both coasts, and including the Gulf, was the same. But we now know that's not correct, that um, gravity has a big effect on sea level uh, from various places around the planet. And so they readjusted this um, data set, the level data, with a bunch of extra um, level observations in 1988. And that's called the National, uh, sorry, the North American Vertical Datum of 1988. And that was all tied to one tide gauge. And that tide gauge just actually happens to be up in uh, Quebec. But they chose that tide gauge because it minimized the differences between the 1929 adjustment and the 1988 adjustment, which pluses and minuses. But keep in mind that um, um, these national uh, level datums were computed once in 1929, the first one, and the second, the last one was done as recently as 1988, which is of what we call our national elevation datum. Okay, we have this problem in Texas that we have not only sea level rise, but we have subsidence. And that's basically called, caused by... Um, in a localized sense by um, the withdrawal of, of water and hydrocarbons out of the, um, the substrata. And what happens, uh, particularly with the water, um, the clays compress and the, um, the whole land uh, subsides. <coughs> and we have had several areas up in Houston that actually have subdivisions that were built back in the 70s and are now underwater right along uh, Galveston Bay. And they've had rates up to 10 feet of subsidence up there since the 70s. Um, actually, subsidence seems to diminish the further you get away from Louisiana, where it's actually it's, it's, it's worse. Uh, the long-term gauge around here is at Rockport, and if you extrapolate that data, it's about one and a half feet per century, so it's not as much as it Galveston, but still fairly significant. So how does this affect the future? Well, it's obvious, um, you know, if you're building stuff along the coast, you want to um, maybe plan for a little bit extra elevation to take into account the sea level rise. That doesn't seem to be happening here on Padre Island, where um, the magic number for floor level elevation, I believe, is nine feet. But nine feet above what? And that nine feet above what is pretty much determined by FEMA, the Federal um, Emergency Management um, uh, Authority. And, and they have what's called um, flood insurance rate, rate maps. And the flood insurance rate maps for um, Padre Island show this magic number of nine feet. But it's actually nine feet above in NGVD 1929. <laughs> They haven't figured out that the sea level is rising and they have not adjusted their insurance maps to, to take that into account yet. But they might one of these days. But basically, um, um, 
this water level is, is affecting um, our mapping. And I'll just show you how that works. This is um, Texas A&M Corpus Christi. You see we're somewhat vertically challenged, close to the water. And this is the topographic map. This is the um, most recent US um, GS, United States Geological Survey, topographic map for Water Island. And you'll see there it's got um, three contours, 5 foot, 10 foot, and 15 feet. Right. And also down on the right-hand side, there's a little triangle with a dot in it called KO2. That's a geodetic control point, which surveyors and mappers use to control um, mapping data. Okay, that's the latest and greatest map. So let's sort of look at when this was produced. This map was actually produced in 1968, but was photo revised in 1975. That means they took aerial photography and plotted on the map uh, new horizontal structures like new buildings, new roads and stuff, but they didn't actually reobserve the, the mapping and, and redetermine what the elevations were. And if you look at the um, other parts of the legend, you'll <laughs> notice that the vertical control is the National Geodetic Vertical Datum of 1929. And that the shoreline shown represents the approximate line of mean high water back in 1929. And so keep in mind those high gauge records from either Rockport or Galveston. The mean high water now is probably about a foot or even more than a foot higher than what it was back in uh, 1929. And so those contours, the 5 foot, the 10 foot and the 15 foot, are more likely to be 4 foot. 9 foot and 14 foot. But this is the official United States topographic mapping for um, the Texas coast. And it's the same from, from you know, Sabine Pass down to um, Port Isabel. And this is that geodetic control point which is on Port Island. It's a, um, a brass disc setting con concrete. Now when they set it, um, where that flagging is that's wrapped around it, that was what the, the, um, the ground level was. So we've seen quite a bit of erosion there. And also this uh, monument is also sitting there and subject to subsidence, just like everything else. And so its value may be a little bit suspicious now that it's been sitting there since 1963. So what I'm getting at here is this Spatial references in the geodetic control, which we use for mapping, including elevations, is a little out of date. And this is one of the reasons why, is that most of the elevations in Texas, and this is out of the National Geodetic Survey database, most of the levels that were observed and all those benchmarks put in place, including on the coast, were done between 1920, uh, say, and about 1960. And they actually stopped maintaining the marks in the 1970s. So this infrastructure, which is actually the control for all other infrastructure, has not been looked at for nearly 40 years now. And it's out of date. And a lot of the marks have disappeared. And there's estimates from 60 to 80% of these marks, depending on where you are, um, have either disappeared or unreliable. And all the ones along the coast have been subject to subsidence since they were observed. So they're not very good. And so because of the, the mapping is out of date, um, local governments and also the Bureau of Economic Geology have been, come along and, and reobserved topographic features using what's called LIDAR, this um, airborne um, digital, ma digital mapping. But the LIDAR has to be controlled by some point on the ground, and they're using those points like uh, KO2 to control it. So one would think that even if you use the best technology to reobserve topography, you've got to go back to, to elevations which were observed back in this period of time. But the National Geodetic Survey has actually introduced a program to fix this. It's called the National Height Modernization Program. And Texas is now one of um, 11 states that um, are now involved in this program, but it's grossly underfunded. So we're trying to fix um, elevations along the Texas coast. 
and actually all over Texas, because we have flooding also in places like Austin and San Antonio. Um, but this, um, one of my last slides, is comes out of um, a book by Bob Morton, which I think a lot of you know, and Oren and Kilke, which was published back in 90, 1983. And it's a sketch showing that if there's an increase in water elevation of D in vertical, that the shoreline retreat is 1,000 times D. Now, I don't know what the origins of this is. I just thought I'd throw that up there for you to ponder. And I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Questions for you? Well, I can't see anything here. There we go. All right. Yes, you may. I'll give it to John and he'll put it on his website. Sure. Uh, my understanding of subsidence was that it included a component for of, uh, the, that uh, factored in the settlement load from the large rivers. No, that's because I'm not a geologist. Um, there's there's some several theories. Like we, we know about the extraction of oil and gas from the waters, making the land settle. But there's also um, a theory that um, um, following the last ice age, when the, the, um, the, um, the ice sheets from North America started melting. Um, the northern part of the um, continent is rebounding from that ice load. And we see that in actually water level um, observations in Alaska and Maine. They're not subsiding, they're actually the land springing back up. So the water level is actually retreating in, in the northern parts of the continent. And so it's kind of acting like a, um, um, a seesawing effect. That, that part of the continent's going up and the, the southern part's pushing down into the water along with the, um, the loading of all the sediments on the uh, continental shelf is causing that. So that's a geological thing. I'm a, I'm a geodesist surveyor. I measure things. I don't explain why they're happening. I'll leave that up to Richard. He's a geologist. <laughs> so all of these lawsuits that you were talking about, mm -hmm. that is, those are the people wanting to know where the vegetation line is? Well, the vegetation line is separate to the this, what we're talking about is the, 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 the line that delineates, that delineates um, the title to real estate. This is what you actually own, right? The, the vegetation line is to do with the Open Vistas Act, right? Which is more like an easement rather than a, a title to where you own. And the, um, the, the actual boundary of the the mean high high water mark, that's allowed to move and it does move and it's encroaching landward as the sea level comes up. Um, but it has to be, that movement has to be natural and imperceptible under the way the courts have interpreted it. So if you get a hurricane and there's a big sudden movement, your actual tidal boundary doesn't change because it's a very rapid event. So your tidal boundary actually may be out in the water, but it's not usable because of the Open Beaches Act, creates an easement for the public to get to the beach. So you might still own the water, and that's why those houses still have the water. They, you know, they, they, the, the, um, the, the movement also has to be um, natural, and there's an argument that you know, because of the um, stopping of the um, sediments coming out from the rivers and building the, um, the jetties was unnatural, which has stopped the um, replenishment of the, the beaches. And so they still have title to their land, but it's out in the water, and it's pretty much unusable. Okay. Which point's that? We hope so. Um, we've moved at the. We have this new um, agency or in part of the religion is called the Texas Spatial Reference Center. And we're getting funds from the United States government to um, NGS to help do stuff like that. They just haven't given it enough money. But we, we can locate that as accurately as possible using GPS now. 
Um, there's still some flaws with using GPS because it gives you an elevation relative to a mathematical surface, which we call the ellipsoid, and not mean sea level. Because mean sea level is a function of gravity, not distance. But it will give you the best available elevation there is that, that science can give you right now. 